Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. And show me what I need to turn off when Don't I'm worry, done. I'll, I'll be here. Don't worry about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all for coming. And this is about my one month in South America. This last, um, actually, when was I there? It was in November, December, I believe. And um, because it was summertime down there. Um, and it's from Rapa Nui, where I started, which is Easter Island, and then through Patagonia and up to Iguazu Falls. And starting in Rapa Nui, you will notice in these pictures, this is just the shoreline, a very rugged shoreline, very rocky, lots of waves crashing. Uh, this island is a seven hour flight west of Santiago de Chile, but it is part of the country of Chile now. Um, it was discovered by some Polynesians just in small boats that came upon it about 1,000 to 1,200 years ago. And the chief of that group that came was um, named himself King when they got there. The, uh, you can see there, is, is the font large enough for you to see? It was larger on my computer, okay. Most, uh, the first Europeans who came were priests that came from Holland and they landed on Easter and that's why they named it Easter Island. But about 50 years later, Captain Cook came along and he called it Rapa Nui, which means Big Rapa because it looked like an island that he had just seen and explored. So he named it Rapa Nui and that is the name that the natives have adopted. When a king died then, back in those days, they needed to figure out how to get another king. And this is, let's see, I've got to figure out how to use this pointer. In order to get another king, these men had to go out to this island, Motunui Island, where these birds hung out. They are the Manutara birds, and the one who came back with the most Manutara bird eggs was the one who was named King. And this, this uh, birdman petroglyph is something that you see around the island. We visited several of the ancient living sites around the island. Back in those days, the people lived in just straw huts, but they lived, most of their life was just outdoors. They slept in these huts. And this guy is a carving that was by the door, and this is to keep the evil spirits away. Over here we have a vegetable garden. They did grow some of their food, and this is one of their cooking places. And this, this lovely lady is a native uh, Rapa Nuiian, and she said, in all of the ancient sites, the cooking circle is made with five stones, but they don't know why. And you'll understand that in just a moment when I get on a little further. But this place right here, this was about, I don't know, about 16 feet long, and about six feet wide, so it's a huge stone enclosure, and right down here is where the chickens go in and out. And the chickens were outside all day, and they went inside at night for safety. But these chickens were their currency, so they were very valuable, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in just a moment. Okay, so here is a little bit about the history of Rapa Nui. And a lot of the Europeans who arrived came with their diseases and they devastated the, with uh, smallpox about 80% of the population. 
And then in the 1800s, a lot of the natives were taken to Peru to be slaves. And there they died from hardships. And while they were gone in the 1800s, um, sheep ranchers were there. And the sheep ranchers pretty much devastated the environment with their sheep grazing all over the island. Um, when the slaves returned to the island, there were only 111 of them. And that is why the oral history of that country has basically disappeared. It was in 1888 that Rapa Nui became part of Chile, but it wasn't until 1965 that the natives there got uh, Chilean citizenship. And then in 1973, when Pinochet was the president, he decided to take a trip out there and let the people know which part of the land belonged to whom. But the people knew his intention, and they manipulated all of the events of his stay that he never got to make any kind of a presentation because they knew who owned which land, and they didn't want their president telling them anything like that. Rapa Nui was a, became a World Heritage Site in 1995 to protect the large moai, and that picture to the left, of course, is one of the moai that uh, is part of their history. And those were all put up between the 14 and 1600s. Each of these moais weighs from 10 to 12 tons, and they were all carved in one quarry. It's a volcanic hillside, and there are several theories about how these moais got moved because they were placed all around in groups, all around the coast of the island. And there is one theory that there were some very uh, spiritually strong people that levitated the Moai to their place. There's another theory about uh, extraterrestrials, and you're going to see something in just a moment, that extraterrestrials were there and they were able to move them. But the most likely is that three men with ropes kind of lassoed around the top, teetered, tottered them, and walked them to their sites miles and miles and miles away and then got them up on the ahu, which is the platform where they all stood. Um, they could not be rolled on logs because the only trees on the island are palm trees and those are way too soft. The moai would just crush them. This is, all of these pictures are at the quarry. And here you have uh, a giant moai that is still lying in place. And these are all different moai. Every moai is different. And it takes about a year to carve them. And that is when the, the people request a moai to be carved when somebody dies, so that person's spirit can protect them and their village. And they, then the carvers are paid in chickens. So they feed the carvers the whole time that they are doing the carving. But this particular moai is very unusual because he's kneeling and he has a beard. And they have never seen another one quite like that. This particular set of moai is the only one that faces the sea. All the others have their backs to the sea because they're right on the coast, but the village was quite a ways inland, so this is inland and facing out to the sea. This particular set is the one that is probably most well-known. There have been some specials on public television. Um, 
This is the Tongariki Ahu, Ahu meaning the platform where they are. And in the tsunami in 1960, they all fell forward. Here is another set of moai at Ahu Anakena. But this particular moai is just above the Tongariki Ahu. This guy was loaned to Japan. Japan wanted one of the moai for a special exhibition that they had. And so they let them take the moai and when they brought it back, the tsunami had happened, so they restored all of the Tongariki moai after they had been allowed to borrow that particular one. Here is one of the reasons. What does this look like? Does that look like anybody? It looks like E.T. He is right behind that last set of moai that you saw. There were a lot of carvings, uh, stones. So this may be one reason why they think there were some extra extraterrestrials that came. This uh, volcano is one of three volcanoes. Easter Island is rather triangular, and there is a volcano on all three points. But this particular volcano is the one that formed the island three million years ago. Here you see several of the moai that have been knocked over by weather, by tsunami. And this is the only moai that we saw that still has eyes. And the eyes are made with coral and white stone. But it's the power of the moai is in the eyes for protecting the people. And once they have fallen over, they no longer have the power to protect. So the moais are basically now uh, museum pieces, but they do stand in place. But they don't serve the same purpose that they used to. Here we've got just a lot of the lovely flowers that are available that we saw on the island. And the Karakara hawk, we saw him quite frequently a lot of different places, but uh, Fortnight Lily, there's just a lot of beautiful flowers there because, of course, it is tropical. We had a show, a cultural show, with dinner that we went to, and when we got there, they offered us face painting, so, of course, I took it, and I have this lovely headdress that they let us wear, and they did a lot of dancing. Now, these dancers you see are fairly conservatively dressed. Some of the first dancers that came out were some of the men, and they basically had on a G-string with shells in the front. Uh, I did not take any pictures of those. Here we have got, I've got a couple of movies, if I can get them to move. What do you think? Can I get him to move? Yeah. The bar should be down here. Huh. Okay. Okay, there we go. And let's click let's click this one too. We'll do them at the same time. And this looks very Polynesian, doesn't it? It was a lovely native dinner that we were fed and the show and we were told stories about their culture and beliefs. to get my pointer back. Pen. Laser pointer. Okay. And then when I don't want that, I go to where? Yeah, 
No, I want to keep the laser pointer now. Oh, it is on. Yep, should be on. I know, but how do I get to turn on a, another video and turn that off? Okay. Thank you. Sorry, a little bit of business here. It's not my computer. <laughs> And these are the only moai that were on the west coast of the island. So we did spend an evening there. We had a kind of finger food dinner and spent a nice, a lovely evening uh, wandering around before sunset and after sunset to enjoy these moai. Coming back from Easter Island, we came back straight to Santiago de Chile and we had a tour one day into Old Town. We did not stay in Old Town. I wish we had. It was a lot more interesting than the upscale neighborhood where we stayed. This is the stock exchange. Um, just some lovely lanterns and doorways. But I'd like to talk just a little bit about, this is President Salvador Allende. I happened to be down in Chile for, I was uh, looking for southern hemisphere snow so I could go skiing. And it was at the time when Salvador Allende was campaigning to be the president of Chile. Uh, and he was elected in 1969. But he, this, and this is the presidential palace. Allende supposedly was a Marxist, but it doesn't sound to me that he was really a Marxist because he believed in the in the Constitution, he believed in democracy, and he did, um, he did good things for the economy. Actually, he made a lot of economic changes, he froze prices, he raised wages, and he nationalized industry. Uh, partly, part of that was the US-owned copper mines, which the US wasn't too happy about, and he began land seizures to give it to the people rather than wait for the government to do it. But he did believe in democracy and constitution and the GDP went way up. But then his adversaries began creating chaos. There were physician strikes, grocery store strikes, fake news, warning against communism. And in 1972, Castro came to visit and encouraged revolution. In 1973, there was huge inflation and clashes on the streets and Allende was blamed. <clears throat> The rich were against Allende because the government and the schools had been made very inclusive, and the rich people did not like that. Still, there were 43% of the population who were pro-Allende, but the military was asked to put down the chaos through the country, and on September 11, 1973, Pinochet, who was the head of the army at that time, backed up by the CIA, killed Salvador Allende in the presidential palace. But I think the people might have been sorry for that because since Pinochet was made president, more Chileans have been killed by their military than by all wars, diseases, and earthquakes. Uh, Pinochet, he sold the formerly nationalized countries that Allende had done to military staff. And there were armed men on the streets everywhere. He disinvested public services, and there was much hunger and starvation. But he did manage to hold power until 1990. He survived an assassination attempt in 1986. But he, anyone that had been pro Allende was killed during that regime. Um, another place that we visited was a lovely Chilean winery. And I don't know, I know that we all like Washington wines, but Chile makes some very good wines. And uh, we had a lovely tour through this very old winery, 1856 still run by the same family. And you notice here, some of their earliest bottling techniques was through a toilet tank. Rather interesting. But I did bring home a couple of bottles of wine from that place that my family was able to enjoy with me. 
We spent a day down in Valparaiso. That is on the coast, down from Santiago, and it is the home of Pinochet. This is his parliament building. It is obviously a seaport. The, this is the headquarters of the Armada of Chile, and we all thought that that looked like a Wedgwood teapot from England because it was the right color and all of the intricate decor on the building, it was just lovely. And it's on a very high hill. Here is, this view is actually, we went way up high on the hill and we were served a lovely local lunch by a family that welcomed us and we had these great views from their balcony. But they told us that all the houses on the hillside are painted in bright colors and the stairways so that when somebody comes in from the sea, they can say, oh, there's my house and there's my wife on the balcony. She's just waving at me. It's also a town of very interesting public art. And it is everywhere. This is a very small part of the public art. And I think this is something that Yakima is trying to do now, getting the um, gang people who have got some wonderful artistic skills to do some murals. And I think they're doing it. But these are a little more tame and colorful and a lot of fun. But this particular one is a bar. It's called Gato. And it was the favorite bar of Victor Jara. Victor Jara was a famous folk singer and protester. And he is one of the people who was murdered by Pinochet. And his body was thrown out into the streets. And there is, on, on Netflix, there is a documentary called Massacre in the Stadium that is the story about a lot of people who were killed by Pinochet, but particularly Victor Jara. They were looking for him among the crowd. From Santiago, we flew to Buenos Aires, and one of the places we visited first was the neighborhood of Boca, which is near the port, and it's where immigrants came in. And when they landed, the ships threw out the um, ballast from the ships, and it was this corrugated metal. And they used that to build their buildings. And you can see these buildings are all corrugated metal, and they painted them very brightly. But here is a couple d dancing the tango. The night, first night we got there, we had tango lessons in the hotel where we were staying because, of course, Brazil, um, Argentina is the home of the tango. And another very interesting neighborhood that we visited is here. It's called Tigre, and we had to go by boat because there are a whole lot of islands, and we traveled around a whole lot of islands by boat with lovely homes, with big lawns, and it's just a very laid-back little village there are boat taxis there so the people can get around, but a lot of the people have their own boats as well. But I thought that was a very interesting laid-back neighborhood of a town of 14 million. This is the center of Buenos Aires. Here is the independence statue of, um, the, it's the plaza of May 26th and of 1810 because that is when Argentina got its independence. And this is the man who was responsible for that. General San Martin got independence for Argentina, but then he immediately went over the Andes and got it for Chile and Peru as well, because he figured that if he didn't do that, the Spanish would just come back into Argentina and retake it. Uh, here, of course, is Eva Perón who is still, Peronism is still very popular in uh, Argentina, and she was very much behind her husband doing great things for the poor people, and that is why they are so popular. This is one side of this independent square. This is another side. This is the cathedral where our current pope, Pope Francis, was the cardinal before he became the Pope. 
I did a lot of walking around the town, of course, and this particular place used to be a family mansion, but it is now the French Embassy. Gorgeous uh, architecture. One evening, we went to this neighborhood that used to be very industrial. It's along the river, and it used to be just warehouses, but now it is the hopping place at nighttime with bars and restaurants. And recently, this bridge was built. It's called the Women's Bridge, and it was inspired by the tango, because you know when the tango is done, the woman gets laid back. That's how it works. The cemetery of Buenos Aires is also uh, right in the middle of town, and it's a place that many people visit. There are huge mausolea throughout, and lots of wonderful statuary. I couldn't even begin to show you all that was there. But this one I thought was particularly poignant. This young lady uh, died on her honeymoon in Austria under an avalanche, and that is her beloved dog. But this place I was really fascinated by. It's the Palacio de Aguas. It's the Palace of Water, but it was built in 1887. But the intricacy on the building, I mean, here's a close-up of just one thing, but it was just such a fascinating building. And the left here is the mausoleum of Eva Perón, who died in 1952 of cancer. It was while her husband was president. Uh, he was president again in 73 to 74. Um, and then his third wife followed him as president. And after, it, but in 1976, there was a military junta, and that began what they call the Dirty War. And that was, the military junta was, they were really horrible. They, first of all, killed anybody that they could find that supported the Perones. But they, when they took, they took the entire family when they took people. And where there were small children or pregnant women or babies, those babies were given to military families. And we heard, and you may have heard the story about the abuelas, that's the grandmothers, who walked in that same square that I showed you, the Independence Square, they walked in circles for the seven years during this dirty war, wanting to know where their grandchildren were. And these are the headscarves that they wore, and so these are painted on the walkway where they walked. Um, but this young lady is Claudia, and we had a lovely presentation from her, and we had a chance to talk to her. But she was taken as an infant, and she was brought up, with a military family. Um, she talked about when she became about a teenager, she did wonder why her parents were so much older than her friend's parents, because she was given to them when they were in their early 50s, and she was an infant. Um, but she, and it wasn't until she was 20 years old People were still looking for these missing children, even this long after the military junta had been in power. And somebody noticed that she was in a family with parents that were so much older. So they contacted the officials that were trying to find the missing children, and she got an official letter from the government, said, you need to come to this particular office on a certain day to sign some papers. They gave her a DNA test, and they were immediately able to reunite her with her biological family, which she was. She is now a young mom, and she says, you know, she says, I don't hate the people who raised me, but I cannot imagine how they lied to me during all of that time. She said, I would never lie to my children. So it was uh, pretty emotional for her to go through all of that. 
We left Buenos Aires, we went to the end of the world. Ushuaia is fan del mundo. That is the southernmost town in the entire world, except, of course, if you count uh, the South Pole as a town. Um, across the bay here, I'm showing off Mount Olivia. Uh, in the bay, there's a lot of crabs, so we had a fresh crab lunch. Here, a lot of towns all around the world have these kinds of town signs. And so this is our group and our guides and everybody else uh, at the Ushuaia sign. And this is just some whimsical painting that I found in town and uh, Ushuaia Bay. Something that we all heard about the Falkland Island War. For the Argentinians, it was the Malvinas War. Those were the Malvinas Islands. They had always been part of Argentina. Uh, people who lived there had sent their children to school in Argentina. They had come to Argentina for medical care, but um, and this war was a very selfish war because it was started by that military regime who were part of what the Argentinians called the dirty war. And they were losing popularity, so they decided that they wanted to get the British out of Malvinas Islands. So they sent, and it, it was only a 10-week war, they sent 17 and 18-year-olds over there with no training, no gear, poorly equipped. And Margaret Thatcher, at the time, was also losing popularity. So she said, oh, yes, I'm in. I'm going to get this for Britain for all times. So it was a very selfish war on both sides. And of course, well, I can't say that the British won, but of course the British overpowered those 17 and 18 year old ones. And the British commander, he called them lions because they fought so bravely. This, this is Osvaldo and he was one of the vets of that war. And he came and talked to us about it, how they were, the uh, ground on the island was very soggy and they were, they, didn't even have boots and they sunk into the ground with their shoes, they had frostbite. The temperature at that time was 20 to 23 degrees Fahrenheit in April and May when they were fighting this war. And they spent the whole time outdoors. They had, uh, there was a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. They did have some cannons, but every time they shot a cannon, it would sink into the muck and mire, and so they'd have to move it again. Um, they came home with PTSD, and you see here that there were over 1,200 suicides after, at the end of that war. That war did not end in a victory for the British. It ended in a ceasefire. And in a ceasefire, that means there will be negotiations to decide who is maintaining control, but the British never were willing to talk about it. So it's still, but it, it destroyed the relationship between the Malvinas and the Argentinians. The people no longer come for education or for medical care. Um, Osvaldo told us that in 2009, some of the surviving vets went to England to meet with some of their enemy combatants and uh, they decided they would write a book. I have searched for such a book, and I have not been able to find it yet. But, um, oh, and this is the eternal flame. Uh, this is a cutout of the Malvinas Islands, and this statement right here says, we people of Ushuaia who with blood watered the roots of our sovereignty over Malvinas will be back. Um, just one other note about that, the dirty war and the military. There is a movie on Amazon Prime called Argentina 1985, and it does show the trials of some of the military generals 
for the crimes that they committed during that time. This is some of the bird life that I found. I took some walks around the, um, around the bay and there was an inlet as well. Lots of interesting and colorful birds. You can see how the red shoveler got his name. Then we got onto a boat there at Ushuia, and the first place we visited was Cape Horn, which is by far the southernmost point of land other than Antarctica in uh, the world. The Albatross Monument that is down there is a memorial to all the ships that didn't make it, and there's our group. There's the Albatross Monument. We, there's our ship out in the sea, and we had to come ashore every place we went ashore on Zodiacs. There was an, um, an, out, uh, an outhouse. There's a lighthouse on the island, and this is a little chapel and with directional signs for many, many different cities throughout the world. This is a map of where our boat went, and Ushuia is here. Then we came down from Ushuia, down around to Cape Horn, and then we went back up. We went up to Wulaya Bay. You'll see pictures of that. Then we came out through the Beagle Channel. The Beagle Channel is, of course, named after the boat uh, that traveled there. And then we came back up Magellan Straits, which, and I'll tell you a little bit of story about how Magellan happened to find that way through. And then up to Punta Arenas. There were some ancient people that lived down there in, uh, around Cape Horn, and the land was called Tierra del Fuego, and they were very hardy people, even in that harsh environment. They didn't even wear clothes, and they traveled in birch bark canoes, but when the Europeans came, a lot of them died, of course, of smallpox and other diseases, and some of them were taken by Captain Fitzroy of the Beagle, and they were taken back to England for a year, and this is Jemmy Button, who, when he was in England, they dressed him like this. This is Jemmy Button back at home. Uh, and he was called Jemmy Button because his father was paid a mother of pearl button to take him away. He was later offered to come back to England, but he declined. But a lot of those indigenous people were killed by the government to make way for more sheep farmers and other foreigners in the late 1800s. And the last full-blooded Yagan person died in 1993, in, at age 93 in 2022. This is a hike we took in Wulaya Bay. I hiked up to the summit with a few of the people with this gorgeous view. We saw a lot of this. They call it Indian bread mushrooms, and I have one that I brought home that's now all dried up. Here's a Magellanic woodpecker, and here is another just wonderful scenic picture of that area. Every place we went on that boat was very scenic. We, we went out twice from our ship we went out twice a day on excursions, mostly morning and afternoon excursions, to visit various glaciers. <coughs> this one is Pia Glacier, hiking above the glacier. And this flower or bush is called a fire bush. And it was, we saw that pretty much everywhere. But there were lots of other interesting, and anybody that knows me knows that when I hike, I take pictures of wildflowers and et cetera and uh, the prickly heath there. When we went to Porter Glacier, there was no place to land. There was no place where we could safely hike. So they had each of us get in the front of the Zodiac and pose a picture. So we had a picture of ourselves at the Porter Glacier. <clears throat> when we were leaving there, 
uh, we got all together and somebody got a picture of the, the, it took two zodiacs to get our group up to the glacier. But while we were doing this picture, one of the boat drivers allowed a sub, uh, somebody that was learning how to be a boat driver to take over the boat. And when he was moving into place, he stepped on something and uh, somehow turned off the gas. But anyway, we ended up having to tow them back to the ship. And uh, one of the guides from the boat was very chagrined by that because he was in the disabled boat and he thought it was pretty horrible that they had to be pulled by a bunch of tourists. Condor Glacier. Here are some cormorants at the Condor Glacier. Uh, this is not my photograph. It is one that I pulled from online, but uh, that's what they look like with that white ruff. And I do have a picture of a condor that I took, and you can see his white ruff, but, ruff, but not quite as clearly as that. Aquila Glacier. There is a cormorant right down by the waterfront. And again, on the hike, we had to hike to get around to that glacier. Um, and there were a lot of different wildflowers on the way. This is just opposite Aquila Glacier. And I just thought this was such a beautiful scene. This is Birkeland Peak, and that's, of course, the same thing there. But this is one of my favorite photos of the whole trip. I just thought it was so, everything there was so scenic. When we got to Punta Arenas, we went out to a park that had models of the ships, some of the ships. And this is Magellan's ship and that made the, the Victoria, that made the first circumnavigation of the world, but not with Magellan, because when Magellan was going down the east coast of South America, he, they, they knew that there was a huge storm coming up, and so he had the ships duck into an inlet that they saw just ahead, and while they went in and waited out the storm, he sent two of his ships. He started out with five ships. He sent two of his ships to further explore that inlet because he was looking for a shortcut to get to the Philippines. He knew the Philippines were over there. But uh, when they did get to the Philippines, he ran into trouble. There was a skirmish, and he was killed. But there is in our library a book called I Was First and I got it just recently. It's a wonderful story of that entire circumnavigation and it was written by a woman in Spain and a friend of mine, I think maybe some of you may know Deborah Ann, she's a wonderful local artist. Her daughter lives in Spain and her daughter translated that book. So when I requested an interlibrary loan for that book at the library, they just went ahead and bought it. So it is available, and it's called I Was First, and it's really quite a fascinating story. But this is on the Straits of Magellan. This is all in that same park. This is Darwin and Fitzroy's ship, the Beagle. That's me just on the bow of the ship, and it was a very, very windy day. Um, and this is Shackleton's boat, boat. If you have never seen the movie or read the book, Endurance, we saw the movie on board our ship. It's the story of Shackleton's unsuccessful attempt to get to the South Pole. But when they finally got back to the water, he wanted to save all of his men, but he didn't have, their, their ship had been destroyed by the ice. So they had this small boat, they rowed, this boat from Elephant Island to South Georgia, and it took them days. It was quite a difficult journey, but they managed to get there, and they got a bigger ship, and they went back, and he saved all of his men. So that was the successful part of his journey.
Patagonia is a word that many of us know because of the clothing line. But the name Patagonia means a land of big feet. And it's because the natives wrap their feet in guanaco skins. And here is a statue at Puerto Natales of Agostino, who was a native explorer. And it shows him just with a huge foot, but it's a bare foot, not wrapped in guanaco skins. But uh, here is some, Patagonia is huge. Here is a little bit of Patagonia scenery, some flamingos, a rhea. Um, I took an early morning walk out by the sea at Puerto Natales and found these black neck swans and some black geese. Then we visited Torres del Paña National Park. Torres del Paña means towers of blue. Um, the, you see the pictures up above. Um, they don't look very blue, but these are sunrise pictures that I took. These are the horns and these are the towers. And you'll see pictures later that make them maybe look a little bit blue. Our hotel was in this lovely river valley and uh, this was just on our way over to do some more exploring into the park. We took a hike the first day past this Salto Grande, which means uh, big falls. Gabby was our hiking guide. It was a miserable day. This says the air speed is 60 to 80 kilometers per hour. I think it should have been here. Here is, just a minute, I need to turn this off. How do I get down there again? I just turned this off. Okay. This one is the video. This is, we several times during the hike, we had to lean on our poles to be able to remain standing. And actually, one woman who could not make the entire hike went back on her own, and she was blown over, and she broke her wrist. She was taken. The, the hotel had a car. They took her to a nearby town where our guide had a brother who worked at the hospital, and they got her casted that night. She got back to the hotel about 2 in the morning, and she was ready to go. <laughs> so it was no big deal. But we got a kick out of the fact that um, there was the no swimming sign at this lake because you see the lake in the lower left. That was, the wind was whipping the water up so much. It was like we were getting rained on. And you see the person who took this video of the, of the high winds, his camera got water spots on it because it was, there was water everywhere. Whoops. And here are some of the wonderful birds that we saw in the park. Uh, you see down there on the lower, towards the right, is my photograph of the condor. And you can see his white ruff around his neck and that gorgeous crested caracara hawk. Um, but some, a lot of southern lapwings we saw. I like the red-fronted coot. I'm making those noises, aren't I? We were, oh, we were very lucky. It is unusual to see pumas in the park. And pumas are of the same family of, as cougars. And one day, we had two separate puma sightings. In the center, you see that gorgeous female Puma, and on the left, we saw a mama and her yearling cub. Actually, she had two cubs, but one of them was just kind of shy and stayed out of sight. But gorgeous, gorgeous animals. And on the right is, are the pictures of guanacos, and these are the skins that the people wrapped their feet around, and why they were called Patagonians were called big feet. Down below, we saw these guanacos, they seemed to be fighting. They were running around and 
I didn't get a video, but uh, they, were, they seemed to be fighting. This is on the grounds of the hotel where we stayed, down in that lovely valley. They had a horse corral, and we went out horseback riding. Um, you see down in the lower center the gnarly trees. They're called Notofagus beech trees. And we saw those all over. Those are the kinds of trees that were alongside all the glaciers. And um, they're, they're so gnarly because of the huge, huge winds that are there. Um, actually, I need to tell you a little bit about the huge winds. Patagonia, you know, is in the southern, very southern part of South America. And if you went anywhere between 50 and 60 degrees south from the east coast and went around the globe, you would not hit any land until you got to Chile. And so they say that is why the winds are so fierce, because there's no land that can stop them. But of course they get to Chile, and then they hit the Andes, and they come up and over the Andes, which are very cold, so they're very cold winds. But fierce, really, really strong winds. We went, this is still in the park, we went out to Gray Glacier. That was another very, very windy day. And, uh, I was, I was wrapped around a tree taking this picture, but you'll see I jiggle anyway. It's just, the, the winds were so, so fierce that it's just, it's hard to stand still. <laughs> Sorry, okay. <laughs> um, the wind actually took my hat off, but I had it tied under my chin so it didn't go away. I need to do this. Some of the wildflowers that we saw throughout Patagonia. The one in the upper left is an anti-inflammatory and a digestive. I liked the prickly mother-in-law cushion. I'm not sure what's behind that name. Sweet peas, of course, we have here. Um, and the black bush. I'm not sure why the black bush is pink, but uh, that was another one of the wildflowers down there. Here are the towers of blue. They may look a little bit bluish. On the right is the massif. It's called the massif. The horns you see on the left. When we hiked that day in the high winds, that's what we were going to see was the horns on the far side. And we got um, above the picture with me and Gabby, our guide, you may have been able to see something sticking up, but we didn't get a good clear view of the horns that day. But the whole valley was surrounded with mountains, and the one in the lower right is a picture that I just took out of my bedroom window. So it was just, it was such a gorgeous place. Then when we left the park, we were still in Patagonia, and we were heading to, we went to this, we went to this sheep farm to have lunch. Um, and this is uh, merino wool that they're growing here. Lucy, down in the lower left, is a sheepdog. She's retired. She's kind of old, but she still loves to she herd the sheep. So her owner took her out and let her herd some sheep for us. And she was in her moment. She was just so happy to be doing that. And he did shear a sheep for us, and we could feel it, and he talked about how they have to clean it and everything. But lower right is our lunch. They had, uh, that was one sheep, and they just had broken it open, and uh, it was barbecued for our lunch, and it was a lovely lunch. Moving further on, still in Patagonia, we went to El Calafate. 
And two of the presidents of Argentina came from this town, as did our trip leader. So he was home when we were there. <clears throat> but um, these presidents were able to get some benefits for El Calafate because of their reign as president. Uh, you see the golf course, the lovely 18-hole golf course on the lower left came when one of them was president. And this is just some scenery from that area. We went to dinner just across the street from these pink flamingos in the lake. Then we went to Perito Moreno Glacier National Park, and this is the largest glacier in the world. It is 26 miles long. And when Christina Kirchner was president, she was able to get that sturdy walkway that's on the lower left installed, and it was, it's a wonderful way because you can really get around on the hillside opposite the glacier and get lots of different views of the glacier. And, of course, down below the walkway, there's lots of different kinds of wildflowers, and I was a little surprised to find something that was called an orchid, and there's some mistletoe. And a thrush, a happy thrush in the tree. Then we got a boat trip to the face of the glacier. And you see the face of the glacier is 20 stories high. And this, that center picture, you can see in the middle, there's kind of, it looks like a little bit of foam. That was a huge calving. It was a huge crash. But I was not quite ready to get a video, so I didn't get a video of the calving, but I did get a snapshot of kind of the aftermath of it. And the glacier carved rocks on the lower right. Then we went up to Iguazu Falls. But while we were up there, we visited a native village called the Guarani. And Topa was our native guide, and there you see some of the homes of the village. But his wife offered us some food to eat, and it was really quite good. Manioc patties, corn patties, and sweet potatoes. Then in the lower left, we went all around the village, and uh, his medicine man made a tea for us for a strong heart and then some of his children and some of the other young ladies from the village did a performance for us. Okay, now we are at Iguazu Falls. It's three kilometers wide, 275 different vertical drops from 60 to 85 meters. Okay, so that's translating to close to 300 feet. These are very high waterfalls, and it is the largest waterfall system in the world, and it is right on the border between Argentina and Brazil. So some of these pictures you see will be on the Argentinian side and some on the Brazilian side. And I, I can't do justice to some place like this. This is a huge, up in the upper left, that is one of the largest waterfalls on the Brazilian side, and there was a walkway out over the river. So um, that's what made the rainbow. Down below, a lot of the different falls have different names. Dos Hermanos Falls and Graceful, Fa Graceful Falls on the right. Upper left is we are looking into the devil's throat, it's called. And this is from a boat trip 
that we took going right up to the face of the falls. And we got pretty wet, but when they got really close to the water, they said, we, had, we were given dry bags. They said, put your cameras away. So we did, and um, we all got very wet. But that was fine, it was warm. But there are just lots and lots of different falls, and we were there for three different days, and did. there are walkways on the Brazilian side, on the Argentinian side, so uh, lots and lots of different fantastic views of these falls. Iguazu Falls is one of the seven natural wonders of the world, and again, Iguazu has one of their town sign names um, that was right near our hotel but it's in a very humid, tropical jungle. Uh, we saw a lot of different butterflies, and you see there an agouti. And some of the beautiful wildflowers that were around Iguazu, obviously very tropical. Uh, up the purple one, <coughs> excuse me, purple one on top, stevia plant if anybody knows the stevia sweetener. And that is the end. Thank you for watching. And thank you, Ed, for helping me. Oh.